Stanford University. I'm Roz Naylor. I direct the Center for Food Security and the Environment. And um, today I'm really happy to introduce one of my colleagues who's going to be speaking. Um, we're going to focus today on climate change in agriculture. And um, I just want to remind you that although we're speaking to you as our main audience in visible sight, the main audience, in fact, for the series are, is a distance learning um, for prospective leaders and emerging leaders in Africa and South Asia who are, are training in food security and food policy. And to those of you who are out there listening to this, we welcome you in the audience as well. So we're really happy to have uh, David LaBelle here today to give the lead talk on climate and agriculture. David um, is one of our colleagues. He looks like he's about 15. So it looks like he just came over from Pali to listen to this seminar. But in fact, he is an assistant professor in environmental earth system science and a center fellow in the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and the Woods Institute for the Environment. David has uh, an incredible uh, uh, resume, and so I'm just going to touch about, on about a one hundredth of it here. Um, his main areas of research are in crop yields and climate change, in the environmental consequences of food and biofuel production, and he works a lot in land use change and farm management and its impacts on the environment. He uh, studied at Brown for his uh, bachelor's in applied mathematics and then went on to do his PhD here at Stanford in geological and environmental sciences in the Earth Sciences School. He did his postdoc in 2008-2009 um, at Lawrence Livermore, and uh, we were really lucky to be able to recruit him back um, to be really a core member of the Center for Food Security and the Environment, and he has really been with us in really shaping the center from the start. Uh, David has just an incredible list of awards. Uh, he was a NASA uh, Young Scholar and, most importantly, a winner of last year's uh, McElwain Award, the AGU Award for Outstanding Young Scientists. And, and to get this award um, is really phenomenal. We're so proud to have him here. When you look at David's CV, he um, has just incredible number of grants. Lori McVeigh, who is our financial administrator, uh, works sort of double time just to keep up administering his grants that he gets about every um, three days or so. Um, but he does publish uh, you know, a, a peer-reviewed article about once every three to four weeks. And you'd think, OK, with this kind of publication record, they're probably in marginal journals. But in fact, uh, most of them are in Science, Nature, PNAS, um, Journal of Climate, you know, places that you really care about. And um, just to list a couple, this year um, uh, he had a very important article on climate trends and uh, global crop production in science, a paper on African um, climate and agriculture in nature, and has uh, an emerging paper in nature uh, climate also um, coming up very soon if it's not out already. Uh, this is just just the past couple of months. So I mean, you can you can look at his CV and you'll see it all. Um, so at Stanford, if you have such a good publication record, you're usually a really lousy teacher because you don't have any time for teaching. But in fact, David is a really popular and outstanding teacher here as well. Teaches modeling courses in environmental earth system science as well as climate and agriculture and uh, land use climate uh, course that he's going to be teaching this winter as well. So we really welcome David Lavelle and i um, very happy to have you as our speaker today. We're also uh, very honored to have uh, Dr. Fatima Denton here who has just come up from Durban. So if you have questions about how the climate talks are going, <laughs> uh, you can get the first hand from, um, from Dr. Denton. Uh, she is actually um, from Senegal. She's the program leader for climate change adaptation at IDRC, which is the uh, Canadian Agricultural Development Organization. Um, she has spent most of her working life, I think, mainly in Africa, focusing on a wide range of African issues. Has been, an, She's a lead author on the climate adaptation chapter in the IPCC and has also worked as a lead author in the AR4 as well as now in the AR5. And so she has a long history with the climate community trying to integrate particularly the, um, the human components of this and how humans are going to adapt and how they're shaping the climate scene. Uh, 
Dr. Denton has studied in Paris and holds a PhD actually in development studies at Birmingham University in the UK, has strong political science training, and has written very widely on food security, uh, local government, governance, climate change, um, women's issues in Africa, and I think brings to us a lot of real firsthand experience of what's going on in Africa, which um, is, I think, very special to us in this distance learning uh, context, as well as just for what's really happening in the real world. So we're happy to have you here, too. Both of you, uh, we welcome you and welcome the audience. I want to make one note as we start. When we get to the questions, we are going to call on students first. So you better think of your questions now. Don't be bashful, because we want to have questions from the students this time, too. Thank you. Well, thanks, Roz. I can't help uh, use Wally's lines uh, about an introduction my father would enjoy and my mother might even believe. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I deserve that. Um, it's really a great honor to be part of this series. I've really enjoyed the series so far. I've learned a lot. And we've seen climate, I think, come up in just about every uh, session in, in some way or another. And today, it, it takes center stage, obviously. And the risk, is, in my experience, of having climate be the central topic is there's a pretty good chance everyone will leave completely depressed by the end. So um, what I thought I'd do at the beginning is sort of get, get over the depressing stuff and then move on. And, and as I see it, the depressing story is that we've known for at least 100 years that you know, fossil fuel burning industrial activities will release CO2 into the atmosphere. And we've also known for that long that releasing CO2 into the atmosphere will alter the Earth's climate. We've also been trying for 20 years or more to find ways to reduce those emissions. Lots of uh, international negotiations like Fatima just came back from lots of bilateral discussions, lots of technology work. But essentially, we've made zero progress. I mean, it, there might be some progress, but it's probably negated by all the, the flights that people are taking around the world to discuss this. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's discouraging, and I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it, especially when you think that if we continue on this trajectory um, for a few more decades, we could get to the point where we'll see something like six or seven or more degrees in global mean temperature increase, which would mean that for parts of the world, you would see something like 10 degrees or more of temperature increase. And at, at those levels, you might ask, well, how hot is that? I mean, that's so hot that there'd be parts of the world where for much of the year, humans wouldn't be able to last very long outside. They wouldn't essentially be able to sweat fast enough to cool themselves down to maintain their body temperatures. So like I said, it's pretty depressing. <laughs> um, much more tractable is, is what we're going to talk about today, which is the next uh, 10 or 20 years and how to adapt to climate change. And, and sort of to put it in perspective, I often think of this like spending a week at my in-laws. It's, it's not something you'd want to do. Um, it's a little bit scary, <laughs> a little bit daunting maybe. But it's not um, the kind of thing that, that we can't survive. And, and you know, maybe we'll even come out stronger for it. At least that's what I tell myself. So um, I'm focusing on the next uh, 20 years today, not because it's the more optimistic time frame. I mean, it, it is, certainly. But because I think that's the relevant time frame for the discussions we have here on, on food security and food policy. Even an even a optimist or a, na a very naive person like me wouldn't think that food policy is made much with a, a time frame much beyond 20 years. And we can talk about beyond that time frame in the discussion, certainly. But really, I'm going to focus today on the next um, 10 or 20 years and, and what I see as the, the needs for adaptation. Now, an hour is, is a long time for a lecture, and uh, especially um, when I'm not sure my voice will last that long. But, but even in normal circumstances, it's a long time. So let me give you a little roadmap of where we're going and, and sort of the big picture. Um, one is I'm going to talk about what I view as the, the relevant lessons from climate science. This is not going to be a, an exhaustive list, obviously, and that wouldn't, that wouldn't be appropriate. But what I'm going to try to do is extract what I think are the, the clear lessons that we, need to, um, that we need to understand or that food policymakers should, should be familiar with. And following from that, I'll talk about what that implies for food security in the absence of effective adaptation. And then finally, I'll talk about, in my view, what this implies for food security. And um, just to be clear, I mean, I think that there's a big gap between at least what I think the science implies for what the policies should be and what the policies or the, the, you know, the realized policies actually are. And a, a very simple explanation for this is that, yes, because science is not the only thing that goes into policy. And you know, completely agree. Peter made this point when he talked about the, the, 
need to bring in political considerations when you're looking at policy. Well, we need to bring in not only political considerations, but all the other you know, fields when we're talking about policy. But I think that's being a little bit too generous. I think that um, a big part of the, the mismatch, I think, is, is really a misperception of what the science is telling us. And so, I mean, in my, at least in my travels around the world, in my discussions with people in agriculture, that to me is, is a non-trivial um, part of the explanation for why uh, there's a mismatch, I think, between what, what should be done and what is being done. So I'll try to, I'll try to be clear on that and, and try to um, spur some discussion on that point. So let's start with the basics. And the basics um, is that the Earth is a sphere spinning around and that it receives its energy from the sun. And it receives its energy from the sun unevenly across the Earth. And this leads, this simple situation leads to a lot of really complex dynamics. People, lots of people in this room make their entire careers out of understanding that complex dynamic. And, and we're all familiar with this in some degree when we look at variations in weather from day to day or even variations from year to year. I think what's harder for people to appreciate is that there's also variations at much larger timescales. Just due to the fact that energy is, is unevenly coming in and it's being redistributed through movement of the air and through the movement of the oceans. And so for anywhere in the world, you'll see if you look at sort of a time series of any climatic variable, you'll see a lot of variation just because of this internal what we call internal dynamics, just the fact that there's a lot of movement going around in the Earth because of, the, um, because of this, this physical situation. Here's an example of rainfall in the Sahel region going back a century, and you can see uh, variation year to year, but you can also see variation on decade to decade. For example, you see a, a wet period here, a dry period here. This is maybe not the best example. This is not all natural variability. We understand something about um, some other changes that were going on in the region. But, but this is not uncommon to see around the world, is that you have extreme variability not only year to year, but decade to decade. Internal variability. <coughs> to contrast that, we're going to talk a lot today about climate change. And climate change is, is changes in the system that are not internally um, derived, but that are forced by external forcings. Things in particular like greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere, things like uh, pollution, aerosols going into the atmosphere. This leads to a change in the energy balance of the Earth, which leads to changes in, in the Earth's climate. And, and for example, this is showing you a, just a little diagram of the greenhouse effect. You add effectively more to the blanket surrounding the Earth's atmosphere that, that keeps energy in. We know that CO2 has been rising um, thanks to the work started by Dave Keeling and continued through time. And so we know that there are climate changes being forced externally. So at this point, really, anywhere you go in the world, there's going to be both climate variability and externally forced climate change. And I think the natural response is, so what? I mean, why is this distinction important outside of uh, academic circles? And you know, that's a reasonable question, because certainly um, any year we'll see a big event. And this year, we've seen quite a few. For example, we've seen record heat throughout the US corn belt during the corn season. We've seen um, really severe drought throughout the Horn of Africa, a lot of um, you know, suffering going on. We've seen big floods in Thailand, for example. And, um, you know, it's a little consolation to, to farmers in this region to say, well, this is kind of variability versus climate change. They probably don't really care. But, you know, I'm, why am I spending five minutes on this then? Not only five minutes, but probably the only five minutes all of you will be paying attention. And, and the answer is that it really does matter. And I think keeping this in mind will, will really help you understand what we do and don't know about climate. And in particular, understanding that not every climate event or climate trend we see is necessarily tied to uh, external forcings. So there's, there's what we would call a, a lot of risks of false positives in terms of if you're trying to think of everything as, as something that's going to continue into the future, that it's a trend that we need to adapt to. Um, but maybe a more important point, I think, for the agricultural community that I've interacted with is there's this perception that um, climate change means more climate variability and that whatever we're concerned about with climate variability is going to be amplified with climate change. I think this is a, um, a problem, especially, for example, in the tropics, because the tropics um, tend to have very low interannual variability in temperature, very high interannual, interannual variability in precipitation. And that sort of mentality that climate change means more climate variability in this, in, in this example will tend to focus your attention on, on rainfall, because this is what you're used to thinking about. This is what you're worried about year to year. And I'm 
and because of this distinction between climate change and climate variability, that's not necessarily the right word, uh, place to focus your attention. So we'll come back to this uh, throughout, but, but this is an important concept to get from the, from the outset. So what I'll do for the climate science section is, is really just talk about three things that we know well and three things that we don't know well. And again, being able to distinguish these, I think, is going to be important when we talk about um, what really makes sense from a, a policy perspective. So one thing that we know well is the Earth is warming. And this is a, a demonstration through time, the last 40 years. You can see the year-to-year -year variation. You can also see in recent years, uh, maybe we'll play that one more time. The colors don't seem quite as vivid here, but um, variation year-to-year, -year, but, but certainly in the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen systematic increases in temperature. Lots of studies to say, is this externally forced change? And yes, it is. Um, you can see a couple features here. One is that the land is warming more than the ocean in general. That's something we expect to continue in the future. Um, you can see that in general the high latitudes warm a lot and that's again something we expect to continue in the future. But I think this, is, th this uh, depiction of the trends is a little bit misleading because as I mentioned natural variability is not the same everywhere. So if we think about trends in their sort of magnitude or degree Celsius, it's maybe not as relevant to people on the ground as how big is it relative to what they're used to seeing. And so I think the, my, my favorite depictions of change are often expressed relative to historical variability. And one of my favorites is, is a figure like this that David Battisti and Riles Naylor produced, which shows you the um, fraction of summer, or the fraction of growing seasons by mid-century that will be warmer than any uh, season that we have on record. And here, unlike the other case where you saw the high latitudes uh, really highlighted, here you see the tropics really highlighted because of that low year-to-year -year variability. And if you look down at the scale here, what this is saying is that even by mid-century, um, you have well over half of the years that are warmer than anything these systems have experienced so far. Okay, so again, significant changes. I think even this, though, risks understating how big these changes are because this is just looking at sort of average temperatures. And we know well that as you shift the distribution, so we have, for example, a norm, uh, in, in normal times, we would have a distribution where you have some cold days, some very hot days, most of the days are in the middle. As you shift this distribution to the right, you not only change the mean, but you, of course, change quite dramatically the exposure to really, really hot events. And we know in a variety of fields, including agriculture, that these really hot events can be disproportionately important. You also see that the prediction from this kind of um, schematic is that you would see a, a dramatic decrease in the amount of really cold events. And this, for agriculture, would be a good thing in, in areas that are prone to frost, in particular temperate systems. Now, these kind of predictions are very consistent with what we're actually seeing. So this just shows you globally here a map and also a time series of trends in the number of really cold nights, trends in the number of really warm days. Cold nights are going down almost everywhere. Warm days are going up almost everywhere. You can see how good the data coverage is in Africa. Um, I'm being sarcastic for those of you on video. Uh, it's, uh, it's, there's other studies that look in more detail at particular parts of Africa, but the, the story is not, you know, is not different in Africa. It's, it's a global story that warm days um, are getting more frequent and warmer, and cold days are getting less frequent and, and warmer. And similarly, if you look out projection, you, projections, you see a, an expected continuation of this trend. These different lines represent different emission scenarios. As I mentioned, we're sort of, we're sort of burning away, you know, going steadily along business as usual. So you probably think the, um, the most extreme line would be the most plausible potentially. But over the next few decades, it doesn't depend so much on the uh, energy scenarios. And you see a decrease in frost days and increase in heat waves continuing into the future. Um, one more point on warming, which I think it, it's just easy, to, I think, to gloss over the warming point. It's easy to, okay, we're warming, what else? You know, we know it's global warming, what else? Um, think about the hottest day in a 20-year period, which is shown here. Um, we'll just focus on the bottom figure here. What's the warmest temperature you've gotten in a 20-year in a period? So something that would you know, make the news and, and be a, a huge record. And you look mid-century and you ask how frequent would that hot day occur? And throughout most of the world, it's basically every year you'd be seeing the, the hottest temperature over a 20-year period. So I think that gives you a sense of how, of how rapid the shift is. You go from something that's quite rare to something that's quite common. Okay. Um, the second, I think, major lesson we have from climate science, which is a, a real you know, accomplishment, is we understand that the rainfall is becoming heavier in the sense that more of it is coming in concentrated events 
the, the fraction of rainfall falling in very heavy events. So whether you choose your threshold to be a certain level of, of millimeters or, or um, whatever, it's, it, more of it is coming in heavy events. And we understand the physics of this. We can see this happening already. This, this is showing you a similar map as before, showing you that heavy precipitation days show positive trends pretty much everywhere we have data. There are some places where you see small trends. So it's not quite as unanimous or as clear relative to natural variability um, as the warming trends, but, but quite consistent, especially when you go to global scales. Um, and it's, again, something we expect to very much continue through the future. And this is expressed as the trend in terms of a standard deviation. So um, again, this, this gives you a sense of how big the increase will be relative to historical variability, and quite a big increase. I think we understand less about you know, where exactly this increase will be fastest versus not fastest. But we understand pretty well that we're already seeing it, and we're going to expect to see the, the amount of, of heavy rainfall, the, the amount of big sort of storms that could lead to big flooding, to lead to inundation of cities and, and, and agricultural areas, are going to be likely to rise. Now, the third thing that we know is um, also, compared to the last, not quite as clear, but it's pretty clear. And partly it's due to the last one, and partly it's due to the first one, actually. So as you get warmer air, you, tend, you, you can hold more moisture, so you and effectively can suck more moisture out of the land. And as you get heavier rain, you get more of it running off and not get penetrating the soil. And those two things contribute to a drying of the soil. But in addition to that, you have a redistribution, to some extent, of rainfall. And the way to think about rainfall, I think that's useful, this is a, a plot that Isaac Held put together at GFDL, is that rainfall is effectively redistributing water around the, the world, right? It, we don't, water doesn't disappear, it's, it's cycled. And what happens because of the circulation, again, going back to that sort of the way the earth is set up relative to the sun and, and it's spinning, what happens with the circulation is we get a lot of rainfall near the equator. We get sort of a, a, an, a lull of rainfall at around 30 degrees north. So this is where a lot of the semi-arid regions in the world are. And then we get an, an uptick in rainfall again um, up, up at higher latitudes. So you can think of this in some way as a redistribution of water around the world. And the way Isaac explains it is to think of it as a bucket of water, um, a bucket taking water from uh, the, the semi-arid tropics to the tropics or to the northern latitudes. And when you warm the air, as I said, you're essentially making that bucket much bigger. And so you can, you can transfer more water in that way. And this is very much what the models show, that, that these models show that you have a climatologically low rainfall here, and you also have a predicted decline in rainfall there. So because of all these factors, these, this rainfall, uh, latitudinal trends, uh, the heavy rainfall and the higher temperatures, you tend to get projections of re reductions in soil moisture for large swaths of, of agricultural areas, in particular at around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. What this shows you here is a, is a uh, an average of climate model projections of soil moisture put together in the last round of the IPCC. And the dots show you where 80% where of the models are agreeing in the direction. So the dots are showing up in these semi-arid areas that are projected to dry, and, and not by small amounts, by 20 or 25% by the end of the century. Okay, so um, these are things that we know. Now let's move on to things that we don't know very well. And things that oftentimes people think we do know well, or things that we we can know well if we wait a, a year or two. And I think all of these things will be, you know, things that we'll make progress on, but, but basically there's a lot of uncertainty still. Um, he, local rainfall is, I think, the number one on the list of things we don't know well. And this, there, there's lots of ways to show that this is an, old, an oldish figure, but just showing you projected changes in temperature and projected changes in precipitation in terms of percent change rainfall and, and degrees temperature for different models. Um, I would just focus on the right triangles here. So you can see uh, a range of temperature projections and a very big range of rainfall projections. Okay, this is for Senegal, showing you some models showing you basically a small increase in rainfall and some showing you a 40% drop in rainfall. Now, 40% drop in rainfall is enormous. It's, it's, it would be huge for agriculture in this region, full stop. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty. It could be 40%, it could be 0%. But it's also, I think, important to understand that it's not going to be 40% everywhere at the same time. As I said before, water is not disappearing. In these cases where a 40% decrease in Senegal, it means the circulation is changing a little bit and it's taking it somewhere else. So it's important in all aspects of climate, in particular with rainfall, to think about scale. And I have a little schematic. I'm sorry, this is just one more figure showing you another region of interest, the Indian monsoon. 
And different models can show fairly big changes in the India monsoon. Not quite as big as we saw before, but something ranging from 30% uh, or more increase to, to decreases over time. The average of models shows a slight increase over time. Now, as a schematic to think about this, just consider two countries that are, that are receiving about the same amount of rainfall that are neighboring countries. Now, let's suppose that climate change causes not only these um, latitudinal dynamics I talked about, um, but, but, but something beyond that that could really cause large changes over fairly short periods of time. So what that might do, for example, is take rainfall and shift it, and now country A is getting only half the rainfall it got, where country B got a 50% a increase. Now, this is huge news for both country A and for country B. Um, but the point is that if you're interested in, in global food security um, and you're interested in something like the aggregate regional um, outcomes, this becomes less important, okay? Huge distributional importance within the region, but at scales, some of these things will wash out. And this is again and again what you see looking at, um, uh, looking at rainfall. So for example, I plotted here the average climate model. Again, each point is a different climate model. The average rainfall change over all the cropped regions in Africa and over all the cropped areas in uh, Asia. And what you can see is you don't really see very often any, any model, much less the average models, but any model getting more than, say, a 10% change over a 50-year period, so less than a 2% change per decade. So the, these, there are uncertainties in rainfall, but they become much smaller as you look at bigger spatial scales. The second thing we don't know, and I'll use the same figure, um, to demonstrate this is, is that we don't really know the rate of warming. We know that it's going to get warmer, as I talked about, but there is still substantial uncertainties. It could get uh, warm twice as fast as, as some models show. show. There's a, you know, often a two-fold range in the amount of warming. So this is a big source of uncertainty. And I think when you hear statements like, we know what happens with temperature, we don't know what happens with rainfall, um, I think that those are um, ambiguous at best. So, so, um, so temperature trends are uncertain, and, and we'll get to whether these matter for, for food security in a second. Now, the third thing we don't know comes back to this variability question. And as I said, often the perception out there, probably the number one misperception I hear is that climate change is, is mainly going to mean more variability. And we don't really know if that's true yet. This shows you some projections made for different regions in Africa for different seasons of mean temperature. So you can, again, see um, warming throughout. And for mean rainfall, and you can see, again, uh, a spread throughout. Because these are averaged over large regions, notice that the, the scale here is nothing more than, say, a 10% increase over, in this case, 80-year uh, period. But if you look at the change in the interannual standard deviation, and there are some reasons that, from dynamics, you'd expect the variability to go up. But some models produce an increase in standard deviation of something like 10 or 20%, but others don't. Same with rainfall. A lot of models show an increase in standard deviation, and others don't. So there's a tendency in these models to want to have more variation, year-to-year -year variation, uh, more uncertainty in, the, in what the actual conditions will be. But it's not a huge tendency. It's something like a 20 to 30% increase. And it's not a unanimous tendency. OK, that's it for the boring climate science. Apologies to the climate scientists out there. Um, that's it for the, the fascinating climate science. And, and to take away from that, I think a, a couple of important things is that um, when you think of climate change, think of more heat, think of heavy rains, and think of uh, more drought at large scales. And also think that climate science is much better um, at looking at broad scales than at local scales. Okay? So in agriculture, we, at least a, a, a sizable fraction of people in agriculture are worried about their neck of the woods. And it's a perfectly uh, reasonable approach. But, but you know, it, and it would, be, it would be wonderful if we could say something about every place in the world. But if we can, it's, it's not, I think, uh, to our advantage to keep banging our head against that wall and, and to take a hard problem and make it even harder by focusing on, on what we can't say. So I think we have to encourage um, a discussion about multiple scales. Okay. Now, when we think about what this means for food security, I, I find it useful sometimes to think about two different pathways of, of impacts. On the one hand, you have the local uh, pathways. So climate's going to change locally. Um, it's going to affect the agricultural systems locally. And that will have effects both on the amount of production locally, but also on the incomes locally. And we've talked a lot about the importance of local productivity, not only for in the short term. So you can think about sort of two timescales here. Short term, a bad year means, means less to eat, less to sell, less income, potentially higher prices, food insecurity locally. 
But in the long term, um, it leads to all sorts of, we've been talking a lot about the virtuous cycle of higher local productivity and how that has all sorts of knock-on benefits about improvements in local economies. You create demand for other services. Um, you build up assets. You can take more risk. All the previous lectures have emphasized the importance of local productivity. And if climate is something that's going to depress that productivity, it's kind of working in the reverse of that virtuous cycle. It's the, the vicious cycle. And we'll come back to that when I talk about implications for policy. Local, local impacts are important, no, no doubt. But global impacts are important, too. And if you think about increasingly, the world is globally connected. And so when we want to understand, say, what's going to happen in Senegal or Kenya, we don't really only want to know what happens in Senegal and Kenya. We want to know what's happening in the global markets. And in particular, if you look even at the more remote places, they're increasingly getting connected to world markets. In overall, um, Africa is importing, obviously, a huge amount of rice and wheat right now, especially in the northern regions and the, the western regions. So what happens in these global markets really matters um, for food, food insecure around the world. So, and, and maybe you're starting to see the connection here. I said before that we can do broad scales better, and I'm saying now broad scales do matter. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Now, how are all these climate factors I mentioned going to affect productivity? I'm going to focus on productivity for reasons um, I mentioned. It's, it's incredibly important for local economies. It's important for global prices. There are other aspects besides productivity effects that will affect food security. There are things like disease prevalence, and that could feed back to, um, uh, to food security. There are things like conflict, and if if flooding leads to migration, leads to conflict, that could certainly feed back to food security. There are lots of arrows you could draw, but I think the two main arrows, at least as I see them, are direct effects on the productivity of agriculture. And these factors I talked about, one is the higher CO2, and that actually is a very significant effect, and it's a very positive effect, because crops, um, uh, I won't assume any knowledge here, crops are in the business of taking CO2 from the air and making uh, and, and doing the magic of photosynthesis and, and making sugars, um, that's what they do. You add more CO2 to the air, it can do it a little bit faster. It's not evenly uh, beneficial across different crops. So there are, in particular, two types of photosynthetic pathways that are common. One that's more common in temperate crops actually benefits a lot. One that's more common in, in, in what we call C4 crops, which are things like maize and sorghum. Uh, actually don't benefit very much, but they do benefit a little bit. So I have a, a double plus sign here for big benefit in high latitudes, little, little benefit in low latitudes. Now the other factors I mentioned, one was drought. And drought, I, I don't think I have to convince you guys, is not a good thing for agriculture. So let's just put two negatives there and, and move on. Heavy rain, um, as I mentioned, this is a problem because of less moisture penetrating into the soil, which is going to be available for plant growth. There's also issues with inundation and flooding and, and causing the plants to die. Um, so heavy rain, it's hard to see that being a benefit uh, in pretty much every system that I'm familiar with. So I'm going to give that negatives. I'm going to give it um, slightly bigger negatives in the low latitude. Uh, not a strong double negative. I, I don't want to get into the justifying that. Uh, but warming is, I think, the less intuitive one. I think people understand drought's bad for agriculture. People understand flooding's bad for agriculture. Um, temperature is, is not intuitive. And again, I think this goes back to this idea that the interannual variability in temperature is typically not that big. It's not typically the thing people really worry about, not the thing people think of as dr driving agricultural production. But in fact, it has pretty large effects. In high latitudes, it can have both warming, can have both positive effects and negative effects. In low latitudes, it pretty uniformly and, and across all crops has negative effects. Now, I think it's important to some extent to understand why this is. Okay, I'm not going to get into the detail of crop physiology, but I think the, the simplest or, or the most common mistake is to think that it's one sim, sim, single thing, and people focus on a single factor. Um, and it really what it is, it's a, it's a multi-factor uh, phenomenon. Basically, any process, any biological process depends on temperature. And there's all sorts of processes involved with crop production. And if I were to categorize them, I would say there's five main reasons. One is these processes of, of growth. So photosynthesis is the production of carbon. Respiration is the consumption of carbon to, to you know, do energy. This is what we do when we eat food and we digest it. We, we get energy. Um, those are both temperature sensitive. Okay? And especially as you get to high temperatures, respiration goes up a lot and photosynthesis goes down a lot. So temperatures can be very damaging just to growth itself. 
Development is more the process of meeting certain life stages. So crops grow from being juveniles to adolescents to, uh, to full adults to being old geezers within one season. It's, a, it's really a, a compressed life cycle into one year for most of the crops that we grow. And this process is really dictated by temperatures. Plants really don't pay much attention to the calendar, as you might expect. They're really um, tuned to the temperatures. And what happens when it warms up is they tend to speed things up. And when they speed things up, they have less time to grow. Okay, so in general, both of these things are negative effects. Um, water stress is a really important one. And so when I talk about temperature, I'm not saying that water isn't important. Water stress is really important, as I mentioned, because for one, as temperatures go up, the ability of the air to take in moisture really increases. So the, the amount of suction you can think of on plants is increased, or the amount of push out of the leaves, the, the, the gradient of water being pushed out of the leaves is even bigger. And plants, in response to this, tend to kind of shrink their, their stomates, or they'll kind of shut down their, their growth to some extent, and that really can, can hurt production, especially as you get to high temperatures. Um, there's also direct, just plain old temperature damage at really high temperatures. Um, I've you know, got plenty of plants in my garden that came home one day after a 100 degree day and it's just scorched and it never recovered. So there are things like that that happen. There are things, there's special sensitivities around particular times, but it can really happen um, at any time of the year. And this goes both ways. So I mentioned the frost, the frost is a, a case of the other way and that's something that we'd expect to get better. But in general, as you get to higher temperatures, you get more of this. And finally, there are all sorts of biotic stresses. Plant, Plants are very much interacting with their environment. Um, pests are very much influenced by temperature, especially if you go from a, a place that used to have a freezing temperature in winter to kill off a lot of pests to one that doesn't. Okay, so for all these reasons, temperature matters. And it really depends on, I think, the net effect of all this depends on three things. One is which type of crop you're growing. Crops are just different, just like uh, people are different. So on the one hand, you have the real temperate kind of cool season crops like wheat or barley, which we know from experiments, um, tends to do best around 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is relatively cool. This is, you know, something like 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So this would be like, um, you know, my grandmother who's always hot no matter what temperature it is. Like wheat is always, wants it to be cooler pretty much. Um, maize is, is, is more of a, a tropical crop obviously and it does better at hotter temperatures about 20 degrees. And then you have things like rice and sorghum, which are really, uh, especially rice because it, it's predominantly irrigated, it really does well up to about 25 C. So big differences between which crops do well at different places. And this is, um, remarkably, you can see this even if you look at global patterns of productivity. I'm just plotting here for four crops. The, um, the a country is a point here, so the bigger countries would be bigger producers. This would be the U.S. for maize, for example, or China for rice. And each point is a country showing you the average temperature in that country and the average yields. And if you want to find really high maize yields, you go to some place that has an average temperature of 20 degrees. If you want to find really high wheat yields, you go to an average temperature of 15 degrees. There are obviously huge differences between country besides temperature, which is why you see so much scatter and why we would never just fit a line through this and use that for analysis. But I'm just fitting a line here to, to just give you a sense of this is not hard to see if you're looking for it, that there is clear temperature optimum and, you know, these people have known that they have high temperatures. They've had them for a long time, but they're still not able to achieve the yields that you see in, in cooler places. So this you know, gets you thinking about what can adaptation really do within a particular crop. I certainly, certainly can do something, but, um, but, but not everything. Now the other two factors I, I put down here, one is the, the sort of the nutrient status of the crop. So we have, uh, I would say, a, a range of conditions from well, very well fertilized to very nutrient stressed. And the very well fertilized crops tend to be very sensitive to climate. And maybe this makes sense to you because if you really don't have any other constraints, then the climate is really going to dictate how well you do. Um, if you're in a very nutrient poor soil in Africa, say, you're applying you know, three kilograms or zero kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, even if you get a beautiful year in terms of weather, you're not going to get much production. So the effects of having good years or bad years is going to matter, and, and you may well be closer to the poverty line, and you may well, that might may have a bigger effect on food security. But from a, from a crop production standpoint, it tends to be the well-fertilized places that are most sensitive. Now, irrigation is a different story. 
In rain-fed systems, and this is not going to surprise you, rain-fed systems tend to be more sensitive than irrigated conditions, both more sensitive to rainfall, obviously, but also more sensitive to temperature because, as I mentioned, a lot of the mechanisms of temperature impacts are through water. Um, now, unlike before where I said, you know, as you increase fertilizers, you actually increase your sensitivity. Here, it's, it's the opposite, where as you, well, in, in terms of the development space, as you increase more to the higher yielding, higher input system, you're actually reducing your sensitivity to temperature and rainfall. So there's, I hope you see what I'm saying here, there's sort of a dichotomy here between, we would never suggest being nutrient poor as an adaptation strategy because, you know, that's gonna have all sorts of other consequences and there's reasons we're trying to transition away from that. But we may well, and, and I'll talk about this more, we may well wanna increase the emphasis on irrigation because we know it has so many other benefits, it's going to have this added benefit. And this was one thing, this was, one way this was driven home to me was looking at a recent analysis that we did with, in collaboration with CIMIT where we looked at thousands of trials they had run throughout Africa. This just shows you the, the black dot showing you where they had run the trials. And they had nicely set this up so they were running it in two sets of conditions. One was well watered, grown during the rainy season, and one was grown during the dry season where they just irrigated it enough to, to basically keep the plants alive, but it was a very water stress condition. And we looked at how these plants were responding to temperature changes. And they, both showed very low sensitivity or relatively low sensitivity to warming it up to about 30 C. But above 30 C, you saw big responses to temperature and you saw much bigger responses in uh, drought conditions. These error bars maybe make it look like they're not significant differences, but a lot of these errors are kind of shared between the two. So, um, so about a 70% higher sensitivity when you're, in this case, when you have the more water stress versus less water stress. Um, another way of thinking about this is that the the benefits of irrigation get amplified if you talk about a, a warmer scenario. And this was a, a recent example the World Bank put out of an analysis of the cost and benefits of a new irrigation scheme in the Zambezi. And this was their cost of a scenario where they were going to triple capacity and the benefits currently of tripling that capacity. And they weren't, you know, very favorable. There was a basically a, a little bit better than breaking even. But if you factor in the um, the avoided damages from climate change because you were now in an irrigated condition, you were now less sensitive to the warming trends, you saw that there was more than a doubling of the benefits. And so the, the cost-benefit analysis really was changed by the consideration of climate change. So this is the kind of thing um, that we're talking about when understanding um, the implications of, of these climate scenarios for, for policy. Now, how does this all add up? So I've talked to you a little bit about the pieces. And now we're going to look at uh, project projections, and I'm not going to go through a bunch of projections. This is really one that kind of, I think, is very typical of what you'll see. This is a map of productivity trends uh, projected by mid-century for different parts of the world. This is like an aggregate over uh, the crops that are commonly grown. And uh, based on what I've told you so far, I mean, if this was a, a class, I would sort of test you here. Um, but there's a few things that you should see that should make a lot of sense to you right now. One is that you see, let me, let me point out also the units here. So you're seeing sizable losses, you know, up to 50% losses in some places, and sizable gains, up to 50% gains. And one thing you see is that there's a big latitudinal gradient. In the high latitudes, as I mentioned, you're not so hurt by warming. You have crops that tend to be benefited by higher CO2. And the opposite is true in the, in the tropics. Um, and so you have this huge latitudinal gradient. Another thing that is, is kind of less appreciated, I think that one is fairly well understood, but one thing that's less appreciated probably is that you have um, high losses in areas that are either very high input but rain fed, so they have high fertilizers, low nutrient stress, but then they have, uh, they're, they're rain fed. So places like the US Corn Belt, um, Brazil, uh, Eastern China for parts of it, and then, um, also, you have the crops that I talked about that were really sensitive. So places that are growing wheat in particular, even if they're irrigated, like in South Asia, they're growing already so far past what they like to be grown out that there you see big losses there. So these, these sort of mega differences should make sense to you. And the third thing you see is still a lot of uncertainty at very fine scale. So anytime you see, for example, a country getting benefits right next to a country with no change right next to a country with big losses, this is an indication of sort of noise in the projections. And if you reround these projections again, Lots of studies have done this. I'm not going to go through them. You would see that, that the uncertainties basically span zero here, and you're not going to be able to tell. So to summarize sort of the science, think about two pathways, the local and the global pathway. At the local scale, there's still a lot of uncertainty because 
Impacts do depend on rainfall. At the local scale, rainfall is still quite uncertain. But there is, I think, at, at least in terms of comparative impacts, less uncertainty um, in the sense that Africa and South Asia, the two regions of focus in this, in this um, series, are going to be at a comparative disadvantage to what happens in the higher latitude areas, with the possible exception of some really well-fertilized rain-fed systems like the US. Um, I think that although a lot of this uncertainty is driven, or there is a lot of uncertainty and it's driven by rainfall, it's still worth remembering that there's still substantial impacts of temperature within those overall changes. And so there's less uncertainty in terms of whether it would be beneficial to adapt to warming. And then in terms of variability, which I didn't show you any projections of, partly because there's not a great literature on that, but there's work being developed, um, there's reasons to think variability in production would go up. This is partly, excuse me, partly because of the projected changes in climate variability that I mentioned. But actually, it's even more so because we're moving crops, if, if I can risk going back here, we're moving crops in potentially more off of where they like to be. And so you're in the part of their response function where you get more year-to-year -year swings, even for a same change in temperature. So this is the kind of thing that we're still trying to figure out, but there's some basis for thinking you would, you would see more variability. You can give me the five-minute warning whenever you need to. Um, on the global scale, there's, um, I think, less uncertainty overall. I think the gains for higher CO2 from higher CO2 at the global scale are going to be uh, sufficient to outweigh the impacts of warming roughly till more or less right now, or say a decade from now. There's uncertainty exactly when that threshold will be crossed. But I think it's, it's you know, I think we shouldn't get into debates about whether the CO2 effects are going to outweigh uh, the effects of, of temperature, because I think even if that was true up until, say, a decade from now, it's certainly not going to be true uh, going forward. As I say here, beyond that upward pressure on prices is very much a robust uh, prediction in the absence of really effective adaptation. And then in terms of um, global volatility, in terms of prices, the topics that Peter Timmer talked about, again, I think there are reasons to expect it, but we haven't understood yet scientifically that that's a sure outcome of what we're seeing. OK. Um, a final point on the science is, and Roz mentioned this paper, is I think that we fall into this trap of looking at projections and talking about the future, when in fact, as I showed at the beginning, we know that these trends are already happening. And so um, what we did recently was try to take these same models we use for the future and, and turn them back and look at the past. And you can see that there are already sizable or, or measurable effects of the trends that we see. This is showing you here just the, the again, the normalized temperature trends. So showing you as a, as a multiple of standard deviations and only for the areas where we grow a lot, of, a lot of food in terms of fraction of land area. And you can see big warming trends throughout a lot of places, not interestingly around some places like the US, but a lot of places you see big temperature trends. Notice that you really don't see much going on with rainfall. You see some increases, some decreases, but not much more than you'd expect. Actually, no statistical difference from what you'd expect just from a natural variability. So um, you know, agriculture is obviously uh, activity with 100 moving parts. And you're never going to be able to you know, very clearly see a smoking gun, even if, even if climate change had huge impacts on agriculture. It would never be. Um, the case that there wouldn't be other effects happening at the same time. Um, but what we see, I think, is that leads us to kind of make up stories about what's happening with productivity trends and maybe neglect some of the factors. So for example, um, all of the productivity trends that Phil Pardee discussed here, I think he's right in general. I think that um, you know, R&D spending has been a major cause of the slowdown. But I think it's a little premature, to, and not that he was doing this, but we shouldn't discount um, you know, the role of warming trends recently. I think what we estimated in this paper was it was about a 10% slowdown in the, the rate of yield gains that we would have had otherwise. Does that matter? We, we can discuss that. I mean, I think it's, economically, it's a big effect. OK, so now I'm going to, um, to, to sort of navigate my way into waters where, where I may, um, well, I'll try to be provocative here, and, and I'll hide behind the fact that I'm a scientist. So. Um, when we talk about adaptation, I think the first and maybe most important thing to, to talk about is that this is, this is big money now, okay? Not necessarily in terms of dollars delivered, but in dollars discussed. So, so far it's been less than a billion dollars overall that for money that's been dedicated to adaptation. It's been very fragmented. Um, most of the money uh, that goes into climate, if you hear sort of climate fund or, or 
uh, any sort of climate development assistance, it's almost entirely for things like the clean development mechanism or, or mitigation activities. So the dedicated activities to date on adaptation are, are relatively small. There's been some really important activities, one that Fatima has been leading, but that's really been the groundwork sort of, I think, in some ways preparing for this big boon in adaptation funding. For example, this pledge of $100 billion per year by 2020 for assisting uh, developing countries with both adaptation and mitigation with, quote, a balance between adaptation and mitigation. Whether that means 50-50 or, or something else, we, we don't know. Huge questions remain, obviously, about whether that pledge will actually be delivered, whether it will be additional to what would have been delivered for other things. Um, but even if it's a small fraction of that, it's going to be a sizable amount. So if it was actual $100 billion a year, that would basically double the amount of development assistance that goes on in the world. So you might, um, you might imagine that that kind of money creates a lot of confusion in the sense that um, if there's $100 billion out there, everybody's problem is a climate change problem, right? And this is, um, you know, confusion is, is going to be good for some people. They can, they can take whatever issue they're concerned about and first of all, you know, not take blame if, if something's going wrong, but second of all, be looking for money to, um, to implement whatever they're trying to implement. And so what happens is everybody talks about adaptation and they mean different things and they typically mean things that will sort of serve their purposes. And again, this is, you know, this is something that is just expected. It's, not, it's human nature. Um, to, to help you sort of wade through some of that confusion, I want to lay out a few key concepts before I start, you know, getting into, um, into opinions. So there's often distinctions made. Here are some examples of what types of things we would, at least in some circles, call adaptation. And there's some distinctions made that are, that are you can decide, but I think that they're useful in, to some degree. One is autonomous versus planned. By autonomous, we mean things that farmers or other private sector um, participants would work on regardless of what kind of in public interventions there were. So things we have essentially will happen, we don't need to worry about them, um, and we should figure out exactly uh, what those are, but we don't necessarily need to um, make them happen. And so you, th you see here, for example, autonomous things would be like building better buildings, um, building water storage facilities, grain storage facilities, et cetera. Another distinction is, is hard versus soft, so whether you're building hard infrastructure like irrigation equipment uh, or irrigation networks, roadways, or soft like information systems, early warning systems, um, moving people around, things like that, encouraging different activities. And then finally, there's this distinction between resilience building <coughs> versus what I'll call impact avoiding. And this is essentially saying, is this something that you would need to do if climate wasn't changing or that would be beneficial if climate wasn't changing? Or is it something that is, is much more beneficial because climate is changing? And so, for example, here, improved roadways, they say, is something that is going to improve your resilience no matter what kind, of sh what kind of shock you're worried about. No matter, even if you're just talking about climate, no matter whether it's temperature changes or rainfall changes, these are always going to be good. And things like flood control would be something that's really specifically targeted towards a climate threat. I don't know in this case why they have improved hospitals as something that's a climate adaptation, but you know, that's, that's their call. Um, now, given these sort of dichotomies, let me just explain what you'll often hear in these circles, what, at least what I often hear, if I categorize them. And one is that a lot of people argue strongly that we should really focus on adapting to climate variability, that climate variability already has huge consequences throughout the world, especially in places like Africa. Um, farmers are already sort of convinced that dealing with climate variability is important. Institutions are already convinced that it's important. And if you build up that capacity to deal with climate variability, you'll have a lot of that capacity, that same um, institutional capacity at least, but even maybe the technologies to deal with climate change. So some very strong advocates of cl about climate variability. And you know, you'd expect it, but those are typically people who work on climate variability. Um, but that doesn't mean they're wrong. Um, another thing you'll hear a lot is that we should really focus on mitigation and not adaptation. And the logic goes something like this. One is that um, the mitigation markets are way ahead of, of the adaptation funding. If you can demonstrate that there's um, credibility in essentially sucking up carbon or reducing other types of greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture, that there'd be this huge market for agriculture for poor farmers to tap. And that revenue stream would increase their resilience more than anything you could do in a targeted way to help them adapt to climate change. And the other side of that argument is that a lot of the things you would do, like building up soil carbon, are going to help you with 
with, say, uh, heavier rainfall or higher temperatures anyway. So let's focus on mitigation. And then the, I think maybe one of the more common things you'll hear, especially from economists, is just to get the heck out of agriculture uh, and do something else and, and import your food. And um, I think that, uh, you know, there's, I'm oversimplifying the case a little bit that they're making, but, but that is sort of a flavor of the argument out there. And then finally, I think there is a lot of, um, a lot of impetus behind just focusing on building resilience. So in other words, understanding that climate is changing, but we really don't want to know the details. We're just going to build resilience in the system. And whatever the particular shock you're worried about is, if we have a resilient system, it won't matter what the particular shock is. So it, and essentially, it's just saying, you know, thanks, climate scientists. You told us climate is changing, but we don't really need any more specific information. And I think that, um, as I said before, we do know some things in, from a climate. We do know some very specific things. And I think part of, that's an example of, I think it's partly based on a misperception that all we know is climate is going to change, but we don't know anything else. Now, what do I think are the shortcomings? And maybe this will be obvious by this point. But when you focus on variability, sure, that will have some benefits. But you risk really emphasizing things that aren't trending. And so if you're really going to, um, say, focus on rainfall fluctuations in a local vicinity that have been trending down for 10 years, you may put a lot of effort into that and then see rainfall pick right back up. And you may be totally ignoring the slowly trending but, but very important for your, uh, for your system trend in heavy rainfall or trend in temperatures. The focus on developing mitigation activities, I think, is, is a nice idea. It's probably politically pretty smart. But scientifically, we're not going to get into the science of mitigation. I think scientifically, it's a pretty weak case right now. And there's a lot of risk of, of sort of credibility damage, but also just you know, wasting a lot of, of peop good people's time and effort on something that um, won't be as effective as other things, both for mitigation and, and for adaptation. And then focusing on diversifying the economy away from agriculture, I think that this is um, you know, a misperception of how the process, as I understand it, from people like Wally and Peter Timmer, how the process works. You don't get to skip agriculture. You get to pass through it. And, um, and, and that's, you know, I think the, we'll, we'll come back to this a little bit, but that, you know, maybe there's an impetus to speed up that process, but it's not to abandon that process and do something else. Now, focusing on, on local resilience um, is, I think, deserving of more than a, a quick bullet point. So let me just explain, I think, partly why there's such an emphasis on this. Partly it's, I, again, because of this, um, I think, misperception of the science that everything's uncertain, so let's just focus on resilience. But part of it is the structure of how this stuff actually works. So if you look at how adaptation funding is currently being set up, you essentially have donor countries um, putting money into big international funds. There's bilateral uh, funds as well, but, but they would follow more or less a similar uh, arrangement here. And then you have recipient countries that need to get put together some credible plan of action to be able to, to get those funds, right? So you, you're putting in a proposal for getting funding. And oftentimes, what, these are called National Adaptation uh, Program of Actions, NAPAs. And oftentimes, the way countries do this is they'll sort of send it out to their um, different districts or states, and they'll each put together their own two or three things they want to do, and then it'll come back up to the country level and go into the, into the proposal. And then from these, you decide on, on the funded projects. So it's very much driven, I think, by the local uh, perspective and by the local interest. So as an example, and this is not at all a pick on one, this is actually uh, a nice and clear one, which is why I took it. But in Niger, these are the rankings of what their NAPA shows. So you see a lot of things like um, introducing, diversifying, promoting, disseminating, um, disseminating, a lot of things about extension, a lot of things focused on um, building local capacity. And, and I'm not saying that these aren't good things, but you have to really question, are these the most effective uh, ways to adapt? Or, or in, in other words, is this going to be enough by itself? Because really, if you look systematically across, this is a, a large part of what's going on right now, is talking about these types of local activities. And it results in, I think, a uh, another sort of loop where the climate scientists now, when they talk to a, a, a person in the ministry, say, and they say, well, you know, you got to tell me what's going to happen with rainfall in my district because I need to decide, you know, what crops to promote. And the climate scientists will say, okay, you know, you know, I think NSF will fund that. And they go back and, you know, they come up um, with projects. This was a uh, headline just the other day um, that came out right before Durban, is there's a big project now to downscale weather uh, rainfall projections so that every vill African village will know what the weather may bring. And this is sort of the um, direction that a lot of resources are going in. 
and you know, I feel free to correct me, the climate scientists in the room, but I'm pretty skeptical that this is not just a dead end, that at least in the next 10 years, we are not going to be able to tell every African village what rainfall is going to be. It's, it's not an easy problem, okay? So essentially, we're taking a hard problem, which is adapting to climate change, and making it harder by, by focusing on this local scale. Now, in contrast, I, at least in my experience, so I've worked a lot with the international organizations, and so it's sort of full disclosure here, but you see that there is a lot that has come out of sort of international coordinated efforts. This shows you just for different um, uh, crops in the developing countries, how many of the crops sown in those countries have ancestry in some sort of international um, effort at, at developing crops. So this is particularly the new crop genotype, crop, species, uh, crop varieties, which is going to be an important part of adaptation. And you can see that across the board, um, you know, especially for some crops, but, but really across the board, that these are, the blue is you know, very, um, very directly out of those programs. The red is typically out of these programs and then combined with more local varieties and then produce something. And you can see across the board, it's been a hugely important source of seeds for the farmers. Now, you may think this is just a developing world story as a whole because Asia has sort of dominated the story and they have you know, a huge, huge adoption of varieties. But even in, if you look in sort of Central and Western Africa, and you look at adoption of modern varieties, overall maize varieties um, have really transitioned in the last two decades from being mostly local varieties to being the majority are um, derived from, again, international uh, activities, either in this case largely through the, the IITA based in Nigeria or CIMIT. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so, again, this is Similar to the point I was making before, let's talk about the world we're in and heading towards, not the world we've been in. I was saying that in terms of global trade and the importance of commodity prices, even in the poorest parts of the world. We're, we're very much in a world now where, where the resilience of these local systems very much depend on the capacity of, of global networks to, to produce new technologies. Um, I think to maybe a slightly lesser degree, a similar thing can be said about technologies and irrigation and infrastructure and irrigation. It requires a lot of coordination, and this is something Fatima has has written about, so hopefully, um, hopefully she won't yell at me for that point. Now, um, this is an example, I think, maybe, maybe it's the best example, but maybe not, of the need for global coordination, the need for sort of pooling resources, because it's not clear that every country will need, say, heat tolerance and drought tolerant varieties. But we're pretty sure that at least a majority uh, of farmers are going to benefit from these kind of technologies. And historically, these have come out of real international efforts partnered with local efforts, but, but really, um, I think, importantly, out of international uh, cooperation. And, and as we look into these really scarier scenarios of, of high levels of change, it becomes that much more important, I think, to coordinate, because we're going to have to start pulling in genes from very exotic species, wild relatives of these crops. We've worked a lot with the Global Crop Diversity Trust on, on understanding how much we'll need this and where, where to find them. But if you're talking about taking wild relatives and, and, and extracting their traits for, say, um, performance in really hot temperatures, it's, it's going to be beyond the capacity of, of, of most individual countries, even, even the ones that are developing fast. So, so that's my two cents on that. And then finally, let me just um, offer a brief summary. And, and I'm not going to um, argue that we need a single approach, but I think we need balance. I think we need to. Um, a particular balance on three particular aspects. One is this focus on variability versus change. We need to maybe not focus exclusively on variability. We need to certainly not at least confuse the two, uh, variability versus change. And, and one sort of subtext there is we need to probably give more attention to heat and less attention to rainfall than is done sort of based on the, the gut reaction of most people in agriculture based on their local year-to-year -year experience. The second is, is related to that as I think we need to balance between local efforts and broader efforts. And at least as I see it, you know, a vast majority of the uh, plans right now are to really work on local resilience. And it's, I, it's probably an unpopular thing to, to do is to, is to sort of downplay the importance of local resilience because it is hugely important. But it's also um, not going to be sufficient. And I think we're, we're going to fool ourselves if we're not devoting a very serious amount of effort to the more coordinated uh, efforts in, in crop development technologies and, and irrigation and things like that. And then finally, on this balance between um, avoiding impacts and, and building resilience. And I think it's important 
for the food policy community to take away this message that climate is going to challenge productivity. It's going to probably make it harder to increase productivity. And any process that you care about that depends on productivity gains, like structural transformation that Usman talked about, or, or um, really any, any lecture I think so far has talked about, if, if that's going to be harder to do when productivity gains are harder to achieve, then it's going to be harder to do the longer you wait. And you probably want to speed things up, um, all else being equal, given that we know climate is, is going to increasingly challenge things. Um, but I don't think you, and I think there's a risk of going too far in that direction, talking about, OK, let's just you know, focus on what we were doing anyway and just give it added importance. Because in some sense, that is um, a very difficult problem. And maybe that's understating the case. But there might be things that are orders of magnitude cheaper and more targeted that would have a lot of benefit. And so I think we need to balance between these general approaches and these very targeted approaches, you know, heat tolerance, um, responding well to high CO2, uh, things like dealing with heavy rainfall, and, um, and other, other things that are informed by the specific climate threats at whatever scale uh, you're interested in. And that is um, all I have in terms of comments, and I'll look forward to the discussion after Fatima's talk. Thank you very much, um, David. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really very pleased and very excited to be here um, at Stanford. Um, it's my first time here. Um, and many of my colleagues are actually quite envious of this um, opportunity that I've been giving. Um, I'm also really very pleased to be commenting on um, David's um, um, presentation. I mean, he's quite prolific. and. Um, has um, done quite a lot of work on these issues, so it's nice to comment on what he's um, what he said so far. My present, I mean, my talk is going to probably focus on the last couple of last slides of um, David's presentation because um, I'm a social scientist, so therefore, a lot of the biophysical processes are things that I have a very superficial understanding of, and um, not that I want to pit one against the other, but my interventions mainly going to be on the, um, the social science angle of this. Um, I'd like to probably start off with one metaphor, and that's the word um, transformation, or at least I should, say, I should start off by saying journey, actually. Um, and that's one word that David mentioned um, in his last, last term slide, um, but mentioned only once. Um, I've just come from Durban, actually. Um, and I think as I journeyed back from South Africa um, to here, there's one question um, that keeps coming back to me. Um, and that's one question that many people in Durban are asking themselves. And that's, why are we still saying some of the same old things over, over and over again? Um, in Durban, many um, advocates are really trying hard to make sure that um, agriculture and food security take center stage in the discussions. Um, that arena is actually quite depressing, and I'm really glad that I'm in um, an environment that's a little bit more receptive and uh, more intellectually engaging. Um, David's um, presentation, I think, is um, refreshingly honest um, um, about the things we know and the things we don't know. Um, and I think that his arguments are really central to this debate um, that is taking place in, in Durban. And, and he's asked many um, central questions, I would say. Um, and that boils down to a couple of other questions that I would like to ask, um, which I, I believe David um, referred to rather intuitively. And that's, um, do we actually need to overstate the fact that there are more than 650 million people in Africa that depend on rain-fed agriculture? Um, do we also need to overstate the fact that Africa is the only continent where food production per capita is declining very fast? Um, and a point that David made quite eloquently, I believe, <coughs> 
um, is that agriculture and food um, production systems are under threat. Um, but climate change is not the only culprit. Um, another point is that David's narrative seems to um, sort of take us um, a little bit further along in terms of showing us there's many different causal chains that we see, uh, which comprises of agriculture, food security, food production systems. Um, and it's hard to not, I mean, well, it's hard not to agree with many of his arguments, I'd say. Um, on the drivers of risk, on the distinction between climate change and climate variability, and on food security. But I'd like to see how we can start by unpacking some of these arguments. Um, let's start with the first one. David talked about food production systems that are under pressure, um, vital resources that are rapidly diminishing, um, and basically climate change is a multiplier of threats. It, it's uh, multiplying all these known threats, um, threats to poverty, um, malnutrition, um, disease, etc. And I think we all know that climate change would also undermine um, four dimensions of food security. Um, that's, um, as we know, it avail availability, access, use, and stability. Um, climate change will also um, basically um, more than just undermine these four pillars of food security, I believe um, test many of the solutions that we already think we know or the solutions that we think we have. Um, and I'm actually sometimes quite amazed by this because many of these technical solutions have been debated on, but they're not radically new. Um, so my question is what is inhibiting um, us from arriving at a, a transformation or transformational process um, in which agriculture takes um, center stage. Um, David um, provided some good understand, I mean, good arguments, good answers in terms of our understanding of the science um, and how this can help vulnerable communities. But again, like I said, um, David said, don't pull any punches, we're at. Um, Stanford, so I'm going to try not to. Um, I, I, would have, I would have loved to hear a little bit more emphasis on that word transformation, because I think it's a key word, especially in the agricultural sector. Um, basically, I think it's all about transformative processes. Um, it's all about journeys. It's all about transitions and these incremental steps that we take to these journeys and to this transitional um, stage. Um, when David talks about looking into the next 20 years, uh, many of the African farmers that we interact with in the Sahel would think that that's a little bit too far for them because their reality is about today. Um, it's more of a short termism. Um, so I think the scale of the problem is such that we also need to think about how human and social responses could in turn be transformational. Um, because of the very magnitude, the scope, the nature, and the quality of these um, um, events as we see them happening. And therefore, our reaction, our solutions need to be um, finding ways on how do we chart a course um, that will be more of a planned course, but that will take us to this degree of transformation that we're seeking. So I think... For me, the first sort of stop um, on this journey, on this transformation journey, is one that will take us to institutional transformation. Um, many of the changes that David referred to, um, both relating to local and global food production pathways, I'd say, would require robust institutions. Um, David placed a lot of emphasis on the biophysical processes, and I, I don't agree with any of that. Um, I mean, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, but basically, many of these would need um, an institutional anchoring. Um, I feel that institutions really sit at that intersection of social and ecological resilience. Um, and basically, the, way, the ways in which these changes are managed. When David referred to food production, um, when he talks about um, local productivity, global productivity, 
and all the implications of that in terms of um, local economies, rural infrastructure, assets and risk. Um, all of these, I feel, are mediated through institutions. Uh, without strong institutions, I believe, the processes of achieving ecological and social resilience uh, will become disabled. Um, another point that David referred to about the financial landscape, and you talked about um, Adaptation Fund and the Green Fund, and also the NAPAs in some ways, um, I think would also demand management and delivery mechanisms that have got strong institutional underpinnings as well. Um, in addition, another of David's point um, towards the end of his presentation was talking about adaptation and mitigation, but also mainly about how we can exploit mitigation activities in, in um, agriculture. Um, and again, here again, I feel that when you talk about solutions around enhancing soil fertility, um, which by the way, many farmers, smallholder farmers in Africa would tell you is probably one of their biggest problems. Um, crop production growth, um, incentive structures, all of these things I feel would require um, good solid institutions because it's all about the kind of changes that farmers need to put in place um, and basically farming practices that will change their, their, their production systems. But I also think that we need to be quite strident about the fact that um, climate change has really unmasked the many challenges that we have at governance level, the many institutional weaknesses that we see. Um, so it seems to me that it's almost impossible um, for us to kind of soldier along with the weak institutions that we have. I almost feel that the institutions that are in place now need to go through a process of renewal um, they need to change, we need to find ways of capacitating these old institutions, but we need to find ways of renewing the existing ones so that they can take on the challenges of this, um, 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 the challenges that are associated with climate change. My, my second observation is basically that we, if we're talking about expanding the choices that farmers um, and smallholder farmers, I'm placing a lot of emphasis, by the way, on smallholder farmers, and if we're talking about how we expand their choices, um, I think we need to try and start seeing adaptation and mitigation as an, a possible optimal mix, mix. And I'm not sure whether the, the word optimal in fact is the right word, but I think we need to try and see how we can, we can take those two into account in terms of exploiting the two. Um, and I guess we're basically and gradually coalescing to the central point, and, and that's the point that we can't, probably need to drink some water here. Um, and the point I was trying to make was that we can't treat adaptation or mitigation separately. Um, when you talk to many people in Africa and many leaders in Africa, they would say that our problem is not a mitigation problem, it's an adaptation problem. We have an adaptation imperative. Um, but I also think that we need to try and act a little bit smarter and get cleverer in terms of how we exploit adaptation and mitigation. Um, because I think by treating them separately, we're reinforcing this flawed and complex um, development system that we have. And it's gradually distancing us from sustainable development, which I'll, we shall talk a little bit about later on. We also know that agriculture is a key contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So therefore, if we're able to take advantage of these adaptation mitigation options, we are allowing agriculture to play a pioneering role because it would be able to show all the other sectors what it needs to do. Um, and I think it's about essentially about looking at risk but looking at risk in a very different fashion. We need to find ways of turning the problem on its head. Um, and we need to look at this whole aspect of interconnectedness, um, addressing risk in a way that we can actually create multiple benefits. Um, and I guess the point I want to make even further is that we need to find ways in which we can use climate change as a pretext 
but as a pretext for stimulating this kind of transformational changes that I talked about, both in the agriculture and food systems. Um, David mentioned also that there are some things about the mitigation activities in agriculture that we don't know much about. It's almost like an uncharted terrain. We don't really understand it very well. Um, but I think when we talk about issues around um, increasing the content of um, soil carbon, um, we can do this because we know it's going to increase the productivity um, in many agricultural systems. <coughs> carbon sequestration, there's been a lot of talk about carbon sequ sequestration and good management um, um, practices and how this can also help in terms of increasing agricultural productivity. Um, and there's a lot of co-benefits to this, I suppose, related to soil carbon retention, um, enhancing soil fertility, reducing the use of nitrous oxide, methane, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, But I suppose the more important point is about how much do we know about all this? Um, I guess um, experimentation is going to be crucially important. Um, and I think that's where I'm a little bit um, cautious because I'm... I think it's, it's great to be um, optimistic about these potentially new practices, um, but I think it's also, uh, we need to be a little bit cautious because what we need to do is basically understand um, through experimentation what the potential benefits of these agriculture um, mitigation activities are. But we need to also find ways of scaling this up in ways that would make um, sense to many smallholder farmers. Um, many, of what we, many of the examples that we see now, even when you look at issues around energy, are quite fragmented. And many of them tend to remain somewhat anecdotal. So I think um, we need to find ways of how, how we scale up and scale up um, pretty fast. Um, my third and concluding um, observation is, basically, I think we need to go one step backwards um, to be able to understand the human security element. Um, many of what you talked about, I believe, would, um, the problems you talked about would place a lot of stress um, on vulnerable people, their livelihoods and livelihood structures. Um, and this is around reduced productivity, degrading environmental conditions, um, failure of the market system, market, which is a key word. Um, so basically, I'm thinking that from that second transformation that I talked about in terms of adaptation and mitigation, we need to find another stop, which to me is a sustainable development one. And I was just having a chat um, with Wally not so long ago about this, um, because it's one of those words that mean so many different things to many different people. Um, but I see sustainable development, um, I see climate change as a threat to sustainable development because it challenges three of the most fundamental pillars of sustainable development. And that's, you know, economic prosperity, environmental preservation, and social equity. So therefore, I think that our challenge is basically that we need to try and not repeat the same mistakes um, there's, there's been a lot of talk, especially when we associate the word transformation and the Green Revolution, there's been a lot of talk about um, the Green Revolution. But I think one of the failures of the Green Revolution is that it didn't take into account sufficiently the knowledge base and the knowledge systems of what people know. And adaptation is inherently about finding people with what they know and basically being able to build on that. But it does mean that knowledge can be contested, it can be strengthened. Um, but it, it's knowledge that we need to also understand. We need to find people with basically the tools that they have and be able to see how we can strengthen those tools. It's not a case of um, putting all, those, um, uh, all the, the, the good knowledge they have in one, in one basket, if you like. Um, uh, the second challenge that I see is that we need to find ways to ensure that the smallholder farmer is not further peripheralized. Um, what do I mean by that? Many of these um, funds that you talk about um, are funds that most farmers in Africa are not going to be able to get hold of. Um, they're going to be marginalized because these are funds that are handled, that are managed by big institutions and people with power. 
So I think we need to find ways to make sure that um, the strong institution I was talking about is not something external to farmers, that it's something that they can also create through their own communities, through their own networks, and through their own safety nets. Um, and I think the last probably challenge is to make sure um, that women who are agents in this um, agricultural sector, that they're not also further peripheralized. Um, we all know that women are important agents of change, but I think we also need to find ways to make sure that some of the strategic decisions that they need to make good decisions, um, some of those decisions they're able to, um, um, that they have processes that would allow them to take part in that. Um, that it doesn't exclude them or sort of lock them, away, lock them out of these um, strategic decisions. Um, and one word which we haven't heard much about is it's nutritional security. I think um, women's nutritional security um, is constantly under threat. And, and we need to find ways to create buffers um, buffers that would allow them sufficient capacity to make good sustainable um, choices. I just want to end with one word um, that you referred to, David, a lot in your presentation, and, and that word is knowledge. Um, I think you're right. The, the science is strong. Um, we've got good evidence uh, about a lot of the things that you talked about in terms of um, climate science, the trends, um, what we know and what we don't know. Um, but I think we need a science that does not reinforce many of the inequalities that we see. Science needs to act as some kind of a regulator. Um, and we need a science that helps us to make that small state, the, those small steps, the small transitions, that process of transformation that I was talking about. Um, the transformation that we seek in the agricultural sector should be able to see how we translate opportunities um, into markets. And that's a word that is crucially important. It's not that people need to be peripheralized or sit on the sidelines. It's how do they take advantage of these opportunities? How do they have surpluses in their pockets? How can it be translated into real market opportunities? And I think we've heard this phrase before. The climate change, um, it's been described as the greatest market failure. So basically, I think we need to start choosing a different trajectory. This is not so much, it's a lot about climate change and the science and the biophysical processes, but it's also about the development pathways that we choose. And I think this whole issue of market is becoming fundamentally important. But I think that the market that we want is a market that needs to have a human face. It's need, it needs to have human values. Um, and when we talk about transformation, many of us think about it in terms of outcomes. But I think the processes are just as important as the outcome. And it's the quality of the processes that we also want to see um, um, change. So basically, there's, there's a word that I've heard quite a lot about just coming from Durban. And it's this whole issue about climate smart agricultural options. And I don't know whether that's going to become another fad, but I think we need to make sure that it isn't, that it leads to a kind of transformation for many of the smallholder farmers in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David and Fatima. Uh, I just wrote down about five questions that I want to ask, but since I did offer to have the students go first, um, I'm going to stick to my word, and I'd really like to hear some questions first by the students in the room. And uh, I see a number of my students in our sustainable development class. You might start there. <laughs> but we will take questions from Berkeley students, too. <laughs> so don't be bashful. We won't answer them, but we'll take them. <laughs> Yes. Hi. <laughs> there's a microphone now coming. Yeah, sorry. There's only one microphone, I think. So. Hey, Don. Thanks. Um, this question is actually directed um, to um, Dr. Denton. Um, you talked about, you know, sustainable development. Um, but this is something, as you mentioned, you know, that sort of could have, you know, a wide range of meanings. Um, even in the, in the Western world, you know, it's 
something that you know we use um, to sort of politicize things, you know, to sort of you know um, make gains, you know, in sort of political pursuits. Um, and it's actually a, um, a word, you know, an idea that sort of implies, you know, um, putting in, you know, lots of resources in whatever you know one's doing um, in terms of um, creating policy and implementing policy. How, but like we're talking about, you know, um, smallholder farmers in Africa, you know, people who are sort of, you know, potentially most affected by climate change. Um, and these are also people that are actually um, preoccupied with some um, sort of sustenance, you know, rather than sort of excellence in agriculture. How do you sort of reconcile these two things? <laughs> I'm not sure I quite understand the central thrust of your, your question, but I think you're talking about, um, the contradictions in terms of um, sustainable development and um, how we make that more operational. Is that, is that well, what you're ex Exactly, in the, context, in the context within which you know, people are preoccupied with, um, um, with um, sustenance, you know, with survival rather than... Um, I think you are right that it, it tends to be quite politicized. Um, but I think it's, uh, it, it's, it has become a political jargon that we need to embrace because of the fact that many governments recognize this word. Many governments use it in sort of, um, you know, um, um, speeches, um, documents, um, reports, etc. So it, it's a language that is familiar to many governments. But I think having said that, we need to find ways of moving away from the politicized abstract meaning of sustainable development to something a lot more practical. Um, and basically, something a lot more practical would mean if you have a climate intervention that is basically, um, or an adaptation strategy, uh, put it that way, that's helping people reduce their vulnerability. Um, but if that vulnerability at the same time is going to um, um, somehow negate certain aspects of um, equity, um, you know, I mean, you can put it in a pastoralist context, for instance, you know. If on the one hand, you're going to make pastoralists less vulnerable, but on the other hand, you know, you're going to place greater burdens on women um, along the same adaptation lines in the pastoralist um, sector, then that intervention is simply not sustainable. You know, so I think we need to find things that inhibit um, sustainable development or the processes of sustainable development. And it's quite difficult, it's quite a challenge. We, we haven't found all the answers. I'm in a chapter where we're looking at climate change adaptation and sustainable development, and I call it the grandfather chapter. Uh, but it's, it's really hard um, to find trade-offs that would make sense to, to vulnerable people. But I think because it's hard, it's not, a necessarily, it's not necessarily an excuse not to try and find solutions. We'll take questions from anybody now. Peter? Uh, thanks. A uh, question for David. Uh, the models you at least were putting up looked sort of linear. And I was wondering whether there's some tipping points or some scary things that might happen fairly suddenly. And I'm thinking in particular of Snow, snow accumulating uh, in the Himalayas uh, or not, and, and then the seasonal runoff, and, and what happens to water uh, if, in fact, we're going to have some big changes in, in the nature of that. California is clearly a, a concern as well. But I just wonder, the, the general question is, are there tipping points out there that you're worried about, and in particular, then the water one? Thanks. Um, I think that you know, the, the longer you look out and the more you admit, the more likely these tipping points are. Um, and the main tipping points I would worry about would be um, rapid melting of, of Greenland, for example, that would cause uh, big rises in sea level, or rapid uh, melting of permafrost and release of a lot of carbon, which would, which would lead to a lot, of, um, a lot more warming. But I do think that actually over the next uh, few decades at least, things are, are more or less linear, especially if if you're looking at big enough areas. But on the water issue, it's actually an exception because I think in a lot of, um, a lot of areas that are dependent on uh, sort of glacial-derived uh, irrigation, so, so places like South Asia, places throughout South America, what you actually see is, is sort of a, a decade or two of benefits from those melting and producing more water. And 
after 20 or 30 years, you see a decline to you know, no flow at all. So it, it creates a tricky situation. Do you, do you develop the infrastructure to take advantage of that additional water for the next 20, 20 years or so, knowing that after that you're going to you know, be up a creek, so to speak? I guess that's a bad, <laughs> a bad point. Um, but it is, a, it is one of these, I would say, more uh, well understood, at least nonlinear, maybe not a tipping point, but something that goes up and then comes down. And, uh, and you see this throughout, I think some areas are already actually at the point where they're starting to decline because the glaciers are, are pretty much gone, for example, in much of the Andes. But the Himalayas are actually expected to peak flow about 2040 or so, and then decline after that. And what discount rate do you use to make that decision? I, I, uh, I don't make a discount rate because I'm not an economist, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I fully understand that, um, you know, that that with any reasonable discount rate, you, you have to really focus on the next couple of decades. And that's why you know, I, don't, I don't think that half of all the development assistance should be tied to climate change. I, don't, I mean, I think that's a ridiculously high number if that were to be true. But as Fatima said, and I think this is an important point, this is, climate has sort of unmasked a lot of the issues going on. And in, and in that sense, it's, um, it's an opportunity for, for all sorts of transformation. I want to just piggyback, since uh, Peter has raised the issue of discount rates, and, and one aspect of a harder definition of, um, of sustainable development might be that you develop now, put the money in the bank, and use that money later um, to deal, uh, you know, either educate people better, um, you know, deal with problems down the road. And it seems to me some of these climate issues are really difficult to look at in that light. And I'm thinking of this because reading China's response today in Durban, um, you know, they're emitting 2.2 gigatons, I guess, relative to the US 1.1, but they're saying they're growing at 10%. Um, they've still got a lot of poverty. They really need to get through this. But I would argue China does have a long run view for their society, yet um, how long can we really wait on the climate front so how fast do these <laughs> transformative institutions have to be? And David, uh, do we have time for that kind of substitution in different forms of capital, from natural capital to you know, financial capital and back? Um, in terms of do we have time to avoid sort of runaway greenhouse warming and, and a lot of the really nasty feedback kicking in, is that, yeah. is that what you're asking? I think you know, it, it depends on, on some uncertainties in, in the, as I said before, the rate of warming isn't so clear. The sensitivity of the climate system isn't so clear. But there are definitely some models that say if you don't peak your emissions in the next decade, you have a very high chance of, of running into a lot of the positive feedbacks that would kick in. So it, it become, at least from a biophysical perspective, we don't have a whole lot of time. Now, maybe from a, a, a socioeconomic standpoint, if you ignore that stuff and that helps you to develop more quickly and we become a uh, a society in 30 years that really, you know, is is capable of dealing somehow with these runaway effects. Um, that's a separate question, but I think most of the scientific um, evidence points towards a, a pretty a pretty short timescale for changing our behavior. And I think the important thing to remember there is that we're not talking about a gas in terms of CO2 that quickly comes out of the atmosphere. This is you can think of it as a bathtub filling up. And right now the faucet is sort of going full speed, even if we change our direction, it's still going to be going pretty fast and we're going to be slowly, slowly slowing it down, but it's still going to be adding and adding and adding. And so you have to really, the climate is responding to the total amount of water in the bathtub, not the direction of the change of the, uh, of the flow into it. And Fatima, are these transformative institutions um, uh, nearby? Or can we, can we see them soon? Do you think there's a possibility to change some of the political economic structures and social structures to get this done? Um, I think yes and no. Um, I think yes, there are nearby. Um, I certainly can think about a couple in West Africa, East Africa. Um, but I think um, the problem is not so much whether they're nearby. The problem is um, what processes do they need to go through themselves? I think um, to be able to embrace many of these problems that we're seeing, um, I think I talked about this whole aspect of renewal. Um, if you look at many of the institutions in Africa, many of them were created about 20, 30 years ago with um, 
a mandate or a remit to look at problems in a kind of loan fashion. You know, it's food security, their certification. Um, and issues like that. And, and the problems that we have now with climate change um, are so complex, you know, so it, it's, it's a, a multiplicity of changes that are happening. And, and the institutions are just not um, catered <laughs> for, to address um, those kind of multiple changes, you know, and the stresses that it places on, on, on human lives and, um, and, and livelihood structures. So I think um, we need to find a way of being more creative in terms of how um, how we, we, we support these institutions, but how we, how we also strengthen what we have now, but also look to new ones as well, because I, I, I just feel that we're not, um, we're not really addressing the problems. Um, but one of the points I made also was that I don't necessarily think that, you know, institutions, we have to start looking at external institutions. I think that there are lots of good things that are happening Suddenly, in, the, in many of the projects that I'm seeing in West Africa, in East Africa, um, partners have realized that adaptation is a whole process. Um, and that to be able to frame adaptation in terms of a problematic, it has to be institutionalized. Um, so where they haven't found the right institutions in place, they have gone about creating those. And creating that process means that you have to bring platforms you know, communities together. You have to bring people that have different stakes, different perceptions, so that they can actually start addressing this problem. But it, it, it does take an institutional framing, a setting, you know, a, 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 a whole set of um, rules and um, social behavior that would actually help in terms of addressing the problems. And, and sometimes these are things that need to be created. Yeah, that's great. We're sort of selected locally and uh, eventually passed up the ladder and that this produces an increasingly complex field which you can't really come up with a single good strategy for. But do you believe that there are any uh, large institutions that are capable of producing, um, I guess, a more coherent adaptation strategy? Uh, and what sort of policy directions would so this institution, I don't know which one you have in mind, uh, need to pursue in the short term uh, to sort of move in a, a better adaptation direction? Uh, that's a great question and, and hopefully enough of it was on the mic, but let me just repeat it um, in case, in case uh, it didn't come through totally clearly. Um, so the question is about the, the process right now set up really for the local and how would some of these more in international or, or at least regional organizations position themselves to be um, bigger players in the, in the adaptation world and I hope that's a good paraphrasing. And, and the first response is I guess I'm, I'm not arguing that um, that both aren't needed, right? So obviously, we don't want to zero out the local efforts, um, but we don't want to zero out the regional efforts. And, and I don't know exactly what the right balance is. I do have some in mind, you know, I mentioned in the talk in terms of crop development, there's a whole network of international uh, crop development run through the CGIAR, the, the Consultative Group on International Agriculture, which has come up periodically here. There's also a lot of, um, Regional institutions, for example, the, the, in West Africa, they have a regional um, set of institutions in East Africa. And I think part of what maybe Fatima was saying is that these institutions um, need to really uh, use this as a chance to, to solidify themselves and to, and to pursue it. In terms of the actual politics of going about securing that, I'm really, um, I'm really not sure. And I think that part of it is just, I think, uh, convincing maybe bilaterally donors that instead of putting all your resources into this international development fund, which is maybe um, already gone the way of focused on local stuff, you should also put into some of these more um, inter international groups or regional groups. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, basically on that question that um, it just seems to me that we are seeing a, a prolifer proliferation of all these different um, strategies. I mean, national adaptation, um, program of actions, um, national adaptation plans, and now we are talking about the NAMAs, you know, so you know, it's a continuity and it's a whole chain. Um, I think that um, when we talk about the, the local processes, it seems to me that even when we talk about the NAPAs, um, people um, in many African countries were consulted. But consultation doesn't necessarily mean participation. 
Um, and I think that um, many of the problems are, that we see today is because of the fact that um, you know, participation was not really sought um, in the ways that we, we understand this to be. Um, and when you look at NAPAs, a lot of the NAPAs do not seem to have a very clear strategy of how they need to be implemented. So it, it seems like a wish list. And now we're, we're, we're looking at these NAPAs with a view to how do we make them more operational. Um, I think another point, though, is that the, many of the countries in Africa, if I take West Africa, which I know very well, um, the problems are not radically dissimilar. Uh, many of the problems around um, water, agriculture, food security, et cetera, et cetera. And there are many organizations <laughs> that, are, that are there in, in, in West Africa that could actually come together to address these problems. Um, you know, we have, a, we have over 58, I think, river basins and, and, and aquifers, transboundary trans ones. Uh, many of these are already dealing with these problems that are of, you know, vital interest to many of these countries, you know. But when it comes to a strategy um, in terms of climate change, it seems like you know, every country is actually trying to do this separately. So there's no kind of uni uniformity of policies. There's no coming together. And I think that that's where it needs to change in terms of that institutional renewal that I was talking about. Um, regional institutions need to come together because these issues are um, issues of stake. You know, they're issues that are linked to energy security and poverty, food security and poverty, you know, um, and water security and poverty. So, so they, they're fundamentally linked, and these are the problems that are affecting those people in, in, in those regions. So it's about how do you, how do you bring all of this together um, rather than treat them as, as separately. If you had to pick one institution in the region that, you know, several countries could all kind of try and bring to the same table, uh, which authority uh, would you select and which policies in particular would you point to as being at the top of the list? Hmm, I'm going to get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you say you I'm going to get into trouble for, for doing this. Um, one institution I would say um, would be SILS, which is actually the, the French acronym. Um, it's an organization that's been created about 30 years ago. But, you know, it's been talking a lot about these issues that we know about in terms of, um, you know, um, food, um, food crisis, um, prevention mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, I think that SILS has a very strong basis because that's what we're looking for. It's an institution that has a lot of the knowledge base. Um, that you can actually start with as foundational and then, and then develop. Um, so SILS is working very closely with Agrimet, which is like a sister organization. And Agrimet also has a lot of knowledge about <coughs> climate science um, predictions. And it does this regionally, but it also finds ways of downscaling these models because you know, Dave was talking about the local and, and the global. And I think many of the farmers in this region do not really understand the global. What they need is you know, models that, that speak to them about their realities, you know, that, that do, do not go beyond a certain time frame. Um, so I think that starting with organizations like SILS, you know, and, you know, understanding where they have knowledge gaps um, and building on that would be, would be a good starting point. Yeah, Marsha. Marsha, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Um, I don't know the first thing about politics, but it seems like, uh, Electoral cycles are on the scale of a couple of years. And uh, if you're thinking about investments in climate change, some of the ones you mentioned have kind of uh, long-term payouts, um, but, you know, costs up front. Um, so I guess my question is, does, does de-emphasizing the importance of climate variability kind of limit what you can do uh, on the policy front if, if you are, you know, uh, pushing these things with, with longer-term payouts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a fair point, and that's probably, it's one of the arguments for focusing on climate variability. As I mentioned, you can get buy-in, not only because they're more familiar with it, but because um, maybe it's, it's the timescales they care about. And, and so, as I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not against that, but I think that fundamentally we have to uh, find ways to address market failures and, and political failures. And, and we see this on the mitigation side, you know, obviously that it's a long time horizon, lots of difficulties politically. Um, and economically, but it's, it's going to be the same issue on the adaptation side. And, and if you went back 30 or 40 years, you can make the same argument for not really investing in, in the CG system at the, at the outset because maybe, um, or, or you know, maybe, maybe that's not quite true because they would have seen the, um, the benefits 
you know, in, in a matter of years if they could really adopt fertilizers quickly. And this is a, a different situation where we expect the trends to be a little bit slower. Um, so I, I don't think, so, so I don't disagree with you in the sense that there is that partial advantage to emphasizing variability. I prefer to emphasize the fact that these trends are already occurring, that we're already seeing them, and that if we don't have some public sector investment in adapting, that no, it, it's not going to happen as well as it could. Fatima, do you have a follow-up on that? Um, well, in my neck, neck of the woods, we talk a lot more about climate variability, um, you know, rather than climate change and temperature. I think we understand it. And when you talk about temperature, I mean, it's very easy to come up with, you know, um, real life examples like Uganda and this whole um, case of um, cotton, what um, um, oh, cocoa, right, and what, what, what it would do to those sort of cash crops. Um, but I think we like to talk about climate variability a lot more because, you know, it's kind of like the, the tip of the iceberg sometimes. You know, and we, we see variability as a proxy, if you like, for, for climate change. And I think in, in many um, of, um, parts of Africa, especially in West Africa, um, the emphasis is a lot more on, on rainfall. And, and it's not just about rainfall, but it's also about the quality of rain as well and the distribution of, of rain. Um, so I guess um, for many farmers in, in that region, um, climate variability is, is, um, is, is easier. It's an easier handle, I guess. Um, but then the point about policy is, um, you know, many of the examples of policy spin-offs that I have seen um, in many of our projects um, haven't been sophisticated policies where um, government have suddenly decided that this is how it needs to be. It's been more or less a gradual phase of policy. Um, we've seen a lot of policy um, impacts, if you like. I mean, and, and I, I've always been very cautious about policy because I say that most of what we try and do is not really influencing policy, but informing policy. Because I feel that, um, you know, it, it, it's not a linear process. It's certainly very messy and very complicated. Um, but some of the examples that we've seen in East Africa um, for instance, we've got a, a, a project um, in eastern Kenya um, where we have a group of people that are basically um, working on um, the whole issue of seasonal forecasting. Um, and these are people that are um, known as um, rain you know, forecasters, basically. They, they call them rainmakers. Um, and they come from a, a particular um, ethnic group where they have inherited this knowledge over generations and generations. And it's very easy to kind of dismiss that and, and make fun of it because, you know, um, most people don't see that as, as important. And because of the severity and pace of climate change, people feel that this knowledge is going to be tested anyway. But um, examples that we've seen is that this group of people have been able to talk to the, metro the Kenyan Meteorological Agency, um, who came in with a lot of skepticism and a lot of reservations. But basically, they've been able to sort of um, compare the results, you know, of their forecasting, you know, and be able to calibrate it in ways that gives them an accuracy of 95%, which I think is quite a lot. <laughs> and with that kind of knowledge, they've been able to sort of predict the kind of um, weather patterns they're going to have and how that's going to impact on agricultural productivity. Um, but, you know, it took a while for that to happen. And um, basically, the, the meteorological agency now have decided to build a resource center, um, resource center to basically, um, um, I would say, um, valorize the, this indigenous knowledge that's, that's coming from these, this group of people. Um, so these kind of policy spin-off takes time, but it also means that there's an element of um, um, reciprocity. <laughs> there's, a, there's an element of trust building as well. And those are some of the, the soft skills that we don't, we don't see very often, um, but are also fundamentally important because for me, uh, I, I see climate change also as um, a change in, in behavior. It's about people, behavioral um, modes of behavior changing. Um, so, so sometimes it's just this little um, spin-offs that you see um, that are not necessarily complicated or sophisticated, but, but happens at the at the grassroots. Jen, and then. Thanks. Um, this is a question for both David and Fatima. Um, there's been an idea sort of tossed around in recent years that maybe one way to gain some traction in the climate mitigation um, scene is to focus on the short-lived climate forcers 
um, as a way to buy time. Climate scientists can debate how much time, but maybe a decade, maybe two. Um, and I'm just wondering if in your work on IPCC and on the ground and in Durban, if, if this is getting any traction and if you guys think it's worth anything. Well, I can say from a, a science perspective, there are some benefits of focusing on these short lived. You see the, in terms of the next 20 or 30 years, you would see a bigger effect on climate than comparable effort on the CO2 gases. And in terms of, actually, in terms of um, monitoring, it's, I think in some cases, easier to focus on the non-CO2 gases because it's very hard to measure soil carbon changes and it's also very easy to reverse those changes when you, know, you till the soil or something. So on top of that, I think the, um, you know, the, a lot of the, in terms of nitrous oxide, which is one of the other main greenhouse gases, uh, using it more efficiently has all sorts of other benefits um, that are very clear, you know, the economic benefits and um, water quality benefits and things like that. So f for a lot of reasons, I think uh, short-lived gases make sense. And, you know, the, the one caveat, which is the reason some people don't fully get on board, is, you know, probably an important one. It's the same reason people didn't want to talk about adaptation for a long time, because they're worried that it'll detract attention from the CO2 problem. And you could do perfectly on the non-CO2 gases. If you don't address the CO2 problem, as I said before, you're setting yourself up for, for really prodigious amounts of warming that, that are going to be hard to constrain. So you know, as I think a lot of what we're talking about today is a matter of emphasis. And it's not a matter of um, things that we're, we're not really discussing any things that I think would push you in the wrong direction. But it's, you know, it's an empirical question of what's going to be more effective. And part of that is the, the politics of it. So in terms of the politics of short-lived greenhouse gases, maybe Fatima can talk about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to say where the emphasis is, even though I've just come from, from Durban, because um, like I was telling someone, the discussion there is a little bit some polarized in many ways, where one group of people are talking about certain things, and another group of people are talking about capacity building, technology transfer, and um, all of those things. Um, I happen to think, because I work a lot on adaptation, but I've also worked in the energy sector um, quite a lot. Um, and and I, I, I happen to think that um, in adaptation especially, um, we can never do um, enough of experimentation. I think that we need, we need to see adaptation almost like a lab, you know, um, where we can experiment more and more. Because I, I, I do think that it's that kind of experimentation that will take us to um, a lot of a lot more knowledge about some of the things that we assume to know that we don't know so well. Um, even when we talk about issues around maladaptation, which as you know, would, is a, a situation where you end up um, doing adaptation work, but that increases a lot more vulnerability. So um, I think um, the short answer to that question is that um, we're never going to have a kind of um, sort of perfect answer. Um, and there's a great deal of uncertainty, um, and we're never, go we're never also going to get to a situation where we, you know, it, it, it's it's perfect in terms of our knowledge of the uncertainties. So I, I, I guess um, we need to try and see how we can experiment a lot more, you know, and how on the basis of that experimentation we can um, um, strengthen the knowledge gaps that we have. Just, I'm sorry to add, just one quick thing. As you said, non-CO2 gases, but um, for those who are not familiar, that you can broaden that to um, non-gassing, non-gas forcings, like uh, like local pollution and black carbon, and those um, have the double benefit or maybe triple benefit of, of improving local, um, uh, you know, human problems in terms of respiratory diseases, but also actually agricultural productivity is often very depressed by by these local pollutants. So you get not only the benefits from mitigating warming, but also a lot of the direct effects of, say, ozones and, and, and direct particulates on the productivity. Yes. So we were, we've been talking about transformation, and that goes in all different levels from institution to even cropping patterns. But a lot of this stuff that we see in terms of transformation, we needed it way before climate change was even on the forefront of our mind. So why and how would climate change change that, I suppose? Because these things were already so big and so important and so obvious before climate change, whereas climate change is something that we see more in the future. And those things were, I would think, would have 
even more impetus for people to make these differences, but they still hadn't happened. So how is this different? Well, well go ahead. Um, that, that's a very interesting question, and I, I asked that question to somebody who is a soil scientist and, and knows a lot more about this stuff than I do. Um, why, why is this changing? Why are we... Um, basically the same question that you asked, because a lot of this knowledge has been out there already. Um, and the, the response that he gave me was that um, the incentives have changed, um, the rationale has changed. Um, the reflex that we go into, you know, now has changed. And I guess that, that is also my observation. I was in Tanzania not so long ago, and we were talking to a number of um, smallholder farmers, um, and they were talking about many practices that they're using to be able to enhance agricultural productivity. Um, and they talked about building bridges, about spacing, you know, about using mukuna to increase the, the soil, um, nutrient content in the soil, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the more I listened to them, even though I'm not a, <laughs> a, a, a natural scientist, my thinking was, I mean, I did agricultural science because I come from the Gambia and it was mandatory that we do agricultural science. And I remember a lot of these practices, you know, um, in my early days at um, um, doing my O-levels. Um, and I'm basically thinking, these are old agronomic practices. So why are, we, why are we talking about this? But even in the context of Tanzania, um, I think what has changed for those people is that climate change has ha actually heightened um, the, the stress that they have already, the sort of fear factor that they have in terms of if we don't do something about it, you know, it's going to get bigger than all of us. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to really um, um, dismantle a whole lot of the things that we had taken for granted. So I think, I think that is what is changing, as far as I can see anyway, um, given the different experiences that I've had in Africa. It's not so much that these are new, um, and it's not so much that you know, um, you know, we're talking about other things. It's, it's just that um, the stresses that were there already, but the stresses are going to be amplified. They're going to be reinforced. Um, and therefore, climate change or adaptation is more almost like an insurance policy. Um, it's something that people go in with a consciousness that if they don't do this, then their situation is going to get worse or, or you know, um, really bad, I guess. So I, I would just say that, I mean, I think nobody disputes your point. And, and in fact, one of the interesting things about this series was in, initially when um, a committee got together to think about the I topics that are, you know, should be covered, um, we all sort of made our individual list, and climate was pretty low on mine, and it was actually lower than a lot of other people's, even though it's what I work on a lot. Because there are, there are clearly other um, constraints that haven't been you know, addressed adequately. And this is why you see a lot of communities in some ways jealous of all the attention climate is getting, and all of, you know, would half of all development money just be dedicated to climate? And I've been in meetings you know, where we spend, ha it's a climate adaptation meeting, we spend almost all the time talking about fertilizers. And I say, you know, fertilizers are wonderful, but they're not climate adaptation. They're something you'd want to do anyway, but they're not something that helps you deal with the new problems. And the response is, well, it doesn't matter. We're just, you know, this is a way to get it done. It's, it's a, you know, a means to an end, and that's all that matters. And, you know, I just have a, a negative response to that kind of attitude because I think it, it sets you up to think, well, let's do all the things we were doing anyway. Let's not be creative about you know, anything new that we need to do. And then after we get to those things, then we'll, then we'll think about climate change. And I think you know, with a small fraction, I'm not talking about 50%, I'm talking about a small fraction of funds really dedicated to the things that we wouldn't have needed if climate wasn't changing. You know, we wouldn't have needed crops that can thrive in 35C temperatures for you know, much of the season. Uh, we, as I showed with the irrigation example, maybe we wouldn't have needed or it wouldn't have made sense to put an irrigation in some regions, but now it, it does. The things that you wouldn't have done if climate weren't changing is what I consider adaptation. But people like much broader definitions because it is an opportunity for them, and I totally understand that. But as a, um, a scientist, I'm, I'm averse to that <laughs> mentality. And, and so, yeah, that's, um, that's why I think it's, it's easy to overemphasize how important climate is because it's, it's obviously in the news a lot. But it's also easy to just become so generic and and offer, you know, if you're offering up overall development as your solution to climate change, I mean, that's, that's a very expensive solution to maybe a very specific problem. 
Um, you know, it'd be like saying if, if you're having car troubles, the solution is to go buy a Cadillac. I mean, maybe, maybe you can do something more targeted and, and if you don't even force yourself to think about it, um, then I think you're setting yourself up for some, some problems down the line. So actually we're pretty much out of time out of time. And so I'm going to actually ask the last question. Um, and, and I was just wondering if you're looking at the audience that is in Sub-Saharan Africa or in South Asia that we're directing this series to, and you had one piece of advice to mentor the future leaders just in 2012. How should they prepare themselves in this next year to lead, really lead in this field, to make a transformative difference? And I'd love to hear from both of you of how you would mentor. <laughs> you want to go first? <laughs> I was hoping you would. <laughs> um. I mean, I, I guess the, the main point I was trying to make today is, um, is I guess, be skeptical of, of what you hear and try to educate yourself on, on uh, what we know and what we don't know. And what you do with that is, is certainly, um, it's going to be a, a very complicated calculation. Of, we, we talked about all these other factors. But I don't think there's anything to be gained from intentionally or unintentionally confusing the matter and from thinking we're doing something when we're not or taking a hard problem and making it harder by focusing on the, the, the real, in a sense, the Achilles heel of some of these climate models, which is the, the real local scale rainfall effects. You'll end up putting a lot of effort and getting a little bit out of it. I suppose, yeah, I would, I would continue in that vein about not um, complicating matters, not over-egging the pudding, if you like, because, um, you know, I, I think we do have a lot of very abstract and academic discussions about these things. You know, what's the distinction between climate change or adaptation and development? And I'm, you know, I, th I think it's important, but at the same time, I feel that, you know, um, farmers in the Sahel or in the Horn of Africa are not really interested, you know. Um, what they want to see is um, an improvement in, in yield, you know, what they want to see is surpluses, um, and what they want to be able to do is put food on their table and, you know, send their children to school. So. I think, I think for our knowledge um, um, as scientists, I think it's important because I think we will, you know, the more we know about these things, the more possibly we can sort of um, work closely with farmers. And it's about working with them. It's, it's not about taking solutions to them, but it's, it's, it's a participatory process. But um, I think, I think it, it, it's not really down to, you know, the, 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 the fine details of, of, you know, how does this sort of intersect with the other, you know, and what are the distinction between this and the other, because I think, um, you know, it's about, it's about the, the field experiences that we see on the ground, you know, and what people know, what they're doing, you know, and how we encourage them um, to basically um, sever perhaps from the bad practices um, that they've been doing and to adopt uh, new ways that would help them in terms of, you know, using that as some kind of a, a buffer capacity. But I think more importantly, in terms of policies, um, you know, the, this tension between um, adaptation and development is a little bit um, of a, a slippery slope in many ways, because um, to some extent, it's creating um, a kind of confusion, I would say, for most of our policymakers. Because I think there is this kind of policy paralysis. Policymakers are saying, well, if adaptation and development are different, so what's the, where's the incentive to, to do adaptation? Um, but I think we need to sort of say that adaptation and, um, you know, and development, uh, they, they, they run on the same tracks, basically. Um, and um, they're not necessarily the same, but they, they, they have to be in the same sort of toolbox. You know, they're, they're different tools that you use and customize um, based on um, where you want to get to and um, the kind of problems you want to solve. So I think we need to not focus too much on those tensions and find ways of sort of embracing the two. And maybe that in that sense, I'm, I'm doing exactly what you don't want to see. I'm um, being no, a I, bit I more generic about this, but. Um. I, I think I'm, uh, I'm on board with that. I think you know, that in many ways, development is, is, is gonna be a really effective way of adapting. And in, in, in you know, two words, my advice might be just be hurry up and do it <laughs> um, because it's not gonna get any easier. 
um, what I'm just worried about is that people will um, you know, do things as they were doing um, or as they were trying to do, and that will certainly do a lot of good. But y you might set yourself up, for example, if, if Africa is, is really successful in, in transitioning to a higher input system and they're still very rain-fed, you might set yourself up um, to be really hammered and with, with, the, with a little foresight in terms of what types of um, approaches will and will, won't work. Like you were talking about climate smart development, um, I think that, that a little bit of, of foresight will, will help. And, and not to just equate development with adaptation, to view them as complementary um, and maybe adaptation is a component of development. Well, I think we've been really lucky to have both the scientific side as well as the institution and the people side here and I want to thank both our speakers and you'll have a chance to talk more at the reception outside. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.